This is Alexandra Levy. This is on December 28, 2017, and I'm here in Florida with Joanna Glass. So my first question for you is to please say your name and spell it. I use my maiden name also, so it's Joanna McClelland Glass, J-O-A-N-N-A. M C capital C L E L L A N D Glass G L A S S. Great, thank you. Um, can you tell us about when and where you were born? I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in nineteen thirty-six. Um, do you want to know more about Saskatoon? <laughs> I know it's a very cold area. Well it's very cold, but uh, I think um, <clears throat> I think the, the general misunderstanding uh, about a place like Saskatoon is that it was in Canada and part of the Commonwealth. So we, for instance, um, in my education, uh, everything was uh, basically focused on British things rather than American. So, for instance, the American Revolution, the Civil War, all that, I actually had to learn all that later. I mean, it's not like it was like Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, by the time I was 10 years old, I had to learn Shakespeare's soliloquies and get up and speak them. Um, and the entire thing of the Commonwealth, the fact that the Brits got into the war in 39 ahead of the Americans uh, at, I believe it was at Dieppe in France, 3,000 Canadian boys died when the pop our population was 10 million. So I don't want to go on about it too much, but that is a big difference between what you might consider a cold Midwest Lincoln, uh, Nebraska, and then again in in literature, even in high school, we had a great deal of Shakespeare, William Wordsworth, Coleridge, um, Percy Bysshe Shelley, things that most Americans don't, don't run into unless uh, they're in pretty fancy prep schools. So did reading all that literature help inspire you to want to Go into that sort of uh, yes, uh, that and <clears throat> again in Saskatoon, one wouldn't necessarily... Now, I should say, in the province of, of uh, Saskatchewan, Regina, there are two major cities. Regina was given the legislature. Saskatoon was given the university. So again, because it was the Commonwealth in Saskatoon, we would have uh, what we used to call East Indian professors, um, uh, Australians, uh, I mean, it wasn't unusual for me to see uh, people on the trolley, you know, with turbans, so it had a certain sophistication about it. And unlike, I think, a lot of American cities, there were three little theater companies that had uh, a, a big influence on, on theater for me. I did not uh, go to college. Um, I had to do sort of part-time work all through, I worked from five till ten all through high school. Um, <clears throat> but in Saskatchewan, um, there was, uh, again, it's, it's a cultural thing, the richest province uh, in, the, in the country is Alberta because of several oil wells, mostly the so-called Leduc well. So whereas um, one would expect young people wanting to go east more, um, there, was, there were a lot of opportunities <coughs> excuse me, in Alberta. And there was a woman there named Betty Mitchell. I think she was American originally. But she was a very, very well-known teacher of theater. And within what was called the Dominion Drama Festival, she seemed to win. Her play seemed to win every year. And so almost essentially right out of high school, um, I, someone luckily recommended me uh, as a writer at a radio station. 
And I did that for a little over a year, and I'd been hearing for probably five years about Betty Mitchell in Calgary. So I went to the boss of the radio station, and uh, I said, I have heard that there's a TV station opening in Calgary, and there's a person there that I'd like to study with, and he very nicely got on the phone and got me a job again as a writer. Now, when I say a writer, these are so-called continuity writers, and so it was um, mostly uh, commercials, advertisements, dog food commercials, dry cleaning commercials, and so on. And uh, so I did that. Um, I had really wanted, for most of my life, to go to, it's called RADA, um, and more well-to-do young Canadian girls who wanted to study in the theatre would go. Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And the most famous thing about that in London is that Bernard Shaw left all of his royalties to that school. Uh, but it just wasn't financially uh, possible for me to do that. So I went down after uh, a year and a half working in Calgary, I went down to the Pasadena Playhouse for a year and studied there and was, um, I guess, kind of, uh, well, when I first got there, of course, I had such a thick Canadian accent and they would send me out for various uh, auditions. I, I managed to get an agent and I was sent out. Um, but I... I had the thick Canadian accent and didn't really couldn't play, you know, Marsha's sister with my accent. And I, I still have a, a little bit of it. It's more of a precise, I think, speech than, and, than an accent. Um, <clears throat> what seemed almost humiliating um, to me, and I, I don't know where I got the sort of arrogance for all this. I certainly didn't have any academic credentials to back it up. But the cattle calls, the, you know, sort of 20, 20 young women being sent out, and it was all entirely on the basis of looks, weight, and so on. And I just found that all very, very uh, insulting. And at, at that time in the East, one of the very popular schools was the Herbert Berghoff uh, Institute, which he ran with his very well-known wife, Uta Hagen. Uta was the first person in the play uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, but prior to that, she had a very, very stellar um, career. She had done a lot of Shakespeare. Um, so the one year in Pasadena pretty much did it for me. It just was not a serious enough place for me. And as I say, it was all about appearance. And uh, I did meet Marlon Brando a couple of times and so on. And, you know, there was, there was some sort of fun stuff for a girl from Saskatoon. Uh, but I, then I, uh, I ended up um, saving enough money to get to New York City. And the first job that I had in New York City was where I met Naomi. And it was the Olin and Matheson Chemical Corporation. Um, <clears throat> I guess um, the writing actually, I mean, even if I was in the radio station, the television station, and at Olin Matheson, if there were uh, if there was going to be a period of an hour where with really not much to do, I would write. Um, and I seem to have, I, I can't account for it in any way, but it is, uh, it's almost a different field, writing dialogue. Not having the license to have you know, a 10-page description of the mountains and the lake and the whatnot, to have only speech to tell the story. And that um, makes a lot of restriction and, and constriction. On, uh, for instance, it's essentially a minute a page. And if you get to 90, between 90 and 100, that's it. 
uh, did, in screenwriting, um, the first screenplay uh, that I did some years later was 120 pages and they wouldn't read it. They sent it back uh, because uh, this was uh, um, a couple of very well-known producing partners, Zanuck and Brown, and they budgeted 75000 a page before anyone was hired. So if you had Julia Roberts in there at 25 million or something, that, you know, that wasn't counted. They just, just the basic sort of fundamentals of getting the thing on its feet uh, <clears throat> was this enormous amount of money. So you have to learn to write um, very precisely. Well, maybe if you want to talk about your career up until the point where you started working for Bill. Yes, well, um, there really wasn't much of a career. I had um, three kids in two years because of twins. And uh, we were in Washington, D.C., and there's really about five years there that I barely remember. I mean, these were, you know, we did, we, we did laundry, we did diapers, I did something at one point like 60 diapers a day. Um, <clears throat> and I would try and write at night, but I would be so exhausted by the time I got everybody bathed and, and into bed that there was just this long period there of my sort of feeling every morning, oh God, this is terrible, you know, throw it as amateur as I was. I had a very good friend that, uh, that I had met. Um, my ex-husband was uh, getting a doctorate in physics at Yale. And I had a very good friend named Austin Pendleton, who's a fairly well-known actor in, in New York, actor, director. And uh, he has, for all of these years, almost 50 years, been a mentor. Um, he very kindly, when I would scribble this nonsense, it was always for the, for the theater dialogue. Uh, but he would, wherever he was, I, I remember that he was in the film Catch-22 with Orson Welles, and uh, he was in a motel somewhere in Arizona or something. And he called me and I said, well, I've got like 10 pages. And so I sent it to, to his motel where he was making the film. And he has been very dependable that way all through all through my career. So it really wasn't until all the kids got into school that I had any, I would basically do what I had to do. Uh, and the kids left at 10 to 8 in the morning. And so I had a very strict discipline until about two. And talk about multitask, I mean, I would write, I would do the laundry, I would talk to the orthodontist, I would talk to the PTA and make their cookies. And um, It just seems to be the female. <laughs> it is the female plate. So the first, uh, I would say, well, uh, again, because of Austin, um, we got a reading of a play that I wrote that was inconsequential, really, but it was at the Ber Berghoff studio. Um, just getting a reading means you've got to get a bunch of actors together without pay, etc. But a reading is so essential, otherwise it's like writing a symphony and you're you have all these instruments and you have no idea how they're going to sound and it's all in your head and then suddenly bodies are attached and nearly always they are the wrong bodies uh, because you pick up actors as you can to just read the thing. And um, uh, so, so readings are really, it, it, it's hard to get them. You have to be fairly established before a theater will even put itself out enough to give you a reading. Um, we had one recently. I have a new play with a very long title. It's called Two Plain Daughters and One Handsome Son, and it's set in New Haven. And uh, very fortunately, we had a reading of it, I think it was November 3rd, in Chicago. Um, 
a little miscasting and so on, but we had probably about 30 people there who afterwards essentially say, I just didn't get this, or what was this about, or how long had that been going on? And so that the clarity of the thing uh, doesn't, doesn't really hit you until you have the reading. Uh, the first one acts, Canadian Gothic and American Modern, were done uh, when Manhattan Theatre Club opened in New York. A woman named Lynn Meadow ran it. I think she perhaps still does. They were the first uh, uh, plays to get, you know, New York Times coverage. Um, <clears throat> It was very successful in, of course, it's easy to be successful in a 50-seat house, and that's what it was. And word of mouth about it was very good. So it was done in the fall, and then Lynn asked if she could do it again in the spring. And a very fortunate thing happened. The director, who was Austin Pendleton, was just out on the street one day, and a friend of his, the actress uh, Maria Tucci, who was, is married to Robert Gottlieb. And Gottlieb was the president of Knopf at the time. And Gottlieb had, in fact, just edited Heller's Catch-22. Uh, and he was mostly known at Knopf for doing very fine novels, editing very fine novels. So Austin said to, to Maria, I'm doing these two one acts at Manhattan Theatre Club, if you can come see them, do. And they did. And about a week later, this incredible thing happened with my agent, Lucy Kroll was her name, rather prominent independent agent in New York. And she get, gets this call from Gottlieb saying, has she ever written a novel? Because he had seen the play and he liked it. And Lucy said, I think she has an idea for one, which I didn't really. <laughs> but you don't get calls from Gottlieb. So she called me very, very excited. And I had worked as a waitress uh, beginning the summer that I was 15 in the Rocky Mountains in, at Waterton Lakes in Canada. Uh, Waterton Lake is half in Montana, half in Alberta. And I had an idea about that. But again, I had, you know, I, it's just so vivid to me that I would say, yes, I have a four-year-old and two two-year-olds. Uh, but I took them to a pool in, in Berkeley uh, every, every summer and pretty much wrote the novel there. The novel was published by Knopf and was called Reflections on a Mountain Summer. I've written one other novel several years later and it was called Woman Wanted, published by St. Martin's Press. And other than that, I've worked in the theater. Um, Woman Wanted, the agent, Lucy Kroll, was able to sell it to, in fact, Zanuck and Brown. It was going to be made, um, I don't know how to make this, this brief, but I have to. Uh, it was essentially, I was hired as the screenwriter um, Gillian Armstrong, an Australian director, was hired. I was sent to Australia to work with her. Um, you should, if you can, see, watch a film sometime called My Brilliant Career. Gillian won uh, the, uh, what is it called, the Golden Palm Award at Cannes for that film. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting film about a young woman in Australia. At, at any rate, she could not direct the film, and the whole thing just kind of fell apart. So ten years later, I get this call uh, from Kiefer saying, I auditioned for that part, and I didn't get it. It was, it was given to Matthew Modine, but do you think I'm too old to play it? And I said, well, no, I mean, with the right haircut or whatever. He really was ten years too old. So that film eventually did get made. Kiefer uh, was in it and directed it. And most of his family is from Saskatchewan. So, <laughs> And it was his grandfather, Tommy Douglas, who actually uh, 
created and got enforced across Canada, uh, universal health care. Um, the Biddle, did you, or, well, yes, I guess, then uh, I'm, I've written, um, I guess, nine plays at this point. Uh, the first, there was a very fine actress named Colleen Dewhurst a few years back uh, who did a play of mine called Artichoke at Long Wharf Theatre in New Haven. Then it was done in New York at Manhattan Theatre Club. Um, I wrote a play called To Grandmother's House We Go that required an 80-year-old woman in it, and we were lucky enough to get a, a very well-known stage actress, now dead, uh, Eva Legallian, very well-known in the theater, and that, was, that went to Broadway, not successfully. Well, Hardly anything gets to Broadway successfully. You probably, you know, you know that, that whole thing. Um, then I had this very strange experience. Um, a very, very famous person in the theater and, and the, as a producer and a director, uh, mostly in the musical theater, is Hal Prince, who directed the original Phantom, um, directed not too long ago, Showboat, uh, worked with Sidney, I'm sorry, um, Stephen Sondheim on nearly all the Sondheim shows. And the first play that he actually ever directed um, was Fiddler. Um, I wrote a very, very serious, uh, difficult drama about my childhood and my dad's alcoholism. And uh, I just, I, it was something I needed to get off my, my chest. It was more catharsis, you know, than anything else. And, but Lucy sent it to um, Hal. And he liked it. And uh, here again, you know, one of those phone calls. Uh, you're kidding, this can't be Hal Prince calling me. But he, he did produce it on Broadway. Um, it well, got, what was that called? It was called Play Memory. Donald Moffat was the lead actor in it, uh, more known, I think, as a stage actor, although he worked in Hollywood uh, a, a lot. And um, it, it, the, the sort of fickle quality of the theater was really delivered. Well, no, there, are, there were two, two times. Um, let me just give you a little example of um, the novice writer's plight. When Reflections on a Mountain Summer was published. One of the first reviews that I read came from the Toronto Star. And they said, essentially, it's a shame to cut down trees for paper to publish stuff like this. <laughs> now, back in those days, they had so-called clipping services. And your agent could collect the reviews from wherever, wherever they were done. So about a year later, the Oxford Daily Mail, Oxford University, uh, because the, the book was published by Macmillan in England. So the Oxford published a review and the, the headline said, welcome to a masterpiece. And Lucy called me. Um, I thought she was ancient. She was, I guess, pushing 70 at the time, but I was very young. And she called me and she said, um, promise me that you will try to understand that neither review is true. <laughs> you're not that good and you're not that bad and you just have to be persistent if you're, you know, if you're going to do it. So that was an interesting lesson. So Hal opened a uh, play memory at Princeton University, a very good theater at Princeton called the McCarter. Sondheim came and it was all very exciting. <clears throat> And the New York Times sent their sort of stringer. They didn't send their lead guy. A guy named Alvin Klein came and just gave it a, a really beautiful review. Appraised everything about it, and I was going to be the next Tennessee Williams and so on. So the very following day, Hal got on the phone, and he was able to raise enough money on the strength of that review to move it to New York. Now, this was a long time ago. This is in the 80s. So we could move it to New York for, I think, six million, which was not, I mean, today it would be 16 at least, 
million. Long story short, moved it in. Uh, the the uh, critic at that time was Frank Rich, who has since become known for a lot of other, I mean, he stopped being a critic and got big time into, into journalism. And he loathed it. And uh, it was hurtful because it was about alcoholism and it was painful for me to write it. And uh, he basically said that it was so bad that he needed a drink at the end of it. <laughs> so there are all kinds of insults that one remembers verbatim. Um, John Simon in New York Magazine uh, interview, I'm sorry, re reviewed, I can't remember uh, what it was. I think it was to Grandmother's House We Go, the Legallian. And uh, said, the trouble with Joanna McClellan Glass is that she's from Canada, which is only slightly behind Bulgaria and Romania culturally. And uh, I mean, it, it, I was just so angry, uh, angry at that. But the, the thing is in the theater is that if the play closes, you know, the following Monday, all the actors are out auditioning again and so on, and you're sitting there with this, this thing for which you have not been paid anything and worked on possibly for three or four years and no theater is going to pick it up. There are about 300 regional theaters, and the way that you have to make your, your living is to get the play out into the regional theaters. If you even get done in New York, they will pretty much read your next play. Uh, otherwise, it's very hard, because theaters can't afford to hire readers. The most successful play, um, has had about 150 professional productions. And then, uh, and the way that works is that you earn your royalty according to the size of the theater and the length of the run. So um, I wrote a play about Francis Biddle. When it was done in, I'm, I'll just give you an example here. When it was done in Philadelphia, which is Biddle Turf, the the entire family for the last 250 years has been Philadelphia. Um, well, I was actually going to just give you an idea of the economics, um, but um, when the play, it's called Trying, and when it was done in Philadelphia, it was done at a theater that really was too large for the play. There are just two characters in the play, Biddle and a secretary, which was me, and one set. So that's a fairly inexpensive play to, to get on. Uh, but the biggest audience that we ever had was in Philadelphia, and I think it's the oldest theater in Philadelphia. It's called the Walnut Street Theater. That is a theater that holds 1,100 people, and I think primarily because it was Biddle and it got such good reviews, they did 30 performances for a month and my royalty was $28,000. So working in the theater goes down from there. Uh, it might be a 500 seat theater that might run two weeks, or it might be a, a theater that just runs six performances over a weekend, but still is a professional theater. Or then when you turn the play over to amateur, Companies, it gets done anywhere in the country where you know they they feel that they can do it, and the author gets essentially a hundred dollars a night for maybe a ten night thing. So the story of uh, of Biddle is um, he was eighty one, and uh, I I think there's a I actually I'll, I'll try and just sum this up I had been working as um, essentially a kind of social secretary administrative assistant um, for a family named Rood in DC. And uh, they went to, to Tobago every winter. And they were very, very well to do. They were from Minneapolis, gold medal flower fortune. and. 
they kept a French domestic couple to cook and bottle. And while I was working for them, um, in just we had just moved to D.C. actually, I guess it was uh, 64, 65 in there. Um, the, the Rude family went to Tobago and she, the elderly woman, was killed uh, in a, a jeep accident. And so I basically finished up the her estate and so on and helped out. And I got to know Alfred and Louise, the, the French couple who took care of them very well. But we had to tie up this whole thing because Mrs. Rude had died. And uh, about a month later, I actually got a handwritten letter from Francis Biddle, who had been attorney uh, general, <clears throat> excuse me, under Roosevelt. And after that, Truman had named him chief judge of the military tribunal at, at Nuremberg. Uh, but, the, you know, I, I was this kid from Canada, and I really didn't... At any rate, I got this lovely handwritten letter saying, you've been highly recommended to me, and I need help three days a week, secretarial help, and um, please call me. So... <laughs> It was such a mystery, but it turned out that it was the cook and the butler from the other house that he had hired. And they had, he, he, he was uh, 81 and very, not senile, but um, just the faculties, everything was very, very slow and he really needed help. I mean, he couldn't do his checkbook at all and he would forget who he wanted, he'd, he'd dial and then forget who he had called. And it was very, very moving to me that a man that had been not just Harvard Law, but he had actually clerked his first year out for Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, just to talk a bit about Francis Biddle, he... Um, he was called a radical patrician because he had grown up in a family. Um, this doesn't this doesn't really occur anymore. It's a very Victorian uh, uh, a kind of thing where um, the wealth certainly mattered, but public service in these families mattered a great deal also. Uh, the feeling being that if you had gone to Groton, as he did, and then his uh, Harvard undergraduate, Harvard Law, that you owed something. But he had been in a very Republican uh, firm, legal firm, in Philadelphia. Again, had all kinds of uh, uh, family uh, connections. Um, I, I should it just, it was amusing to me that he wrote two volumes of autobiography and uh, in the first one, A Casual Past, he talks about how the family, uh, they left England not in poverty, but they left because they were so-called dissenters, they were Quakers, as was William Penn. And so in his casual past, he says that the Biddle family came to Philadelphia in 1647 and purchased from William Penn 400,000 acres of what is now New Jersey. So that's how he began. Um, this radical patrician uh, Republican thing was a very big thing because he essentially uh, just rejected all of that and became a, a member of the New Deal. Uh, but of course, Franklin had gone to Groton uh, ahead, of, ahead of him, so there was very much, I mean, I think it probably still exists in DC to the Eastern schools and the way, you know, the, the way that works. Um, at the very end of his life, and uh, I can't really talk in any kind of detail about Nuremberg, um, I, I, I certainly had to handle paperwork concerning the archives, 
uh, the most of the Nuremberg papers are at Syracuse and some are at Georgetown. He had, uh, his wife was Catherine Garrison, Catherine Chapin Garrison Biddle, you know, the Chapin School, it was that, it was that family. That family actually, I think, was wealthier than, than the Biddles. Um, I, I, I was always very fond of her and she was a very fine, very fine poet. But she always, you know, she suffered from being the wife of, of the, the famous man. Uh, let me just, again, try and cut to the chase a little bit. At the very end of his life, his two greatest regrets were that they lost a son, a seven-year-old boy. Um, they, they, the first son was two years older and was fine. The seven-year-old boy developed some sort of strep throat thing. I'm not, I really can't remember what it was. But um, both Biddle and Mrs. Biddle had this kind of mantra all through their lives uh, of saying, whenever they talked about the boy, of saying, you know, penicillin could have saved him, but it wasn't available then. And, and they were very, very elderly, and every time the boy was mentioned, you know, they would say, you know, penicillin could have saved him. And it even turned out that the help, the, the, the French help, whenever the boy was mentioned, they would say that. So that certainly stuck in, in my memory. The death of that boy um, uh, caused them, um, unfortunately, to, uh, they kind of stayed in the house and nursed their, their grief uh, and it was very difficult for the son who lived. He was essentially kind of rejected. Um, and um, I know him quite well, and uh, Biddle's um, daughter-in-law, the son that lived, I'm, I'm still in touch with her and she's 97. His major regret, which really uh, overshadows all of this, was that he signed the law uh, that, that caused the, yeah, as, as you know, the Japanese internment. He, he just never got over the fact that he signed that. And I, yeah, again, I don't have any immediate experience because um, all of that happened to him during the Second World War, even prior, to, you know, obviously prior to the uh, Nuremberg stuff. And... I was a little kid on the prairie. I barely knew who FDR was uh, uh, at that time, so I can't speak in any great detail about that. But when he um, when he let down this facade, this very Victorian facade that he had, well, we just watched the movie The Post, and he knew Catherine Graham, and uh, I remember him saying on a couple of occasions, because they hated to go out, they were old and they were feeble, and uh, he would say, oh no, uh, if, if uh, Mrs. Graham calls, you answer that call and you, you go and you, uh, you attend. But she somewhere referred to him as the sardonic Mr. Biddle. And he was not uh, you know, a fuzzy wuzzy easy character uh, to be with. And it was almost like a marriage with the two of us being uh, above this stable. And he would really take it out on me uh, when, you know, the, he would dial and then say, who am I calling? And he was humiliated and deeply hurt. It was very painful for him. But I would know that the minute, <coughs> excuse me, the minute that happened, it was going to be a hell of a day. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> so did he ever talk to you about the Japanese interpreter? Oh, yes, yes. It wasn't so much that he talked to me, but um, in this, in, it turned, he, he said to me the day that I started that he thought he had one year left. And in fact, he did have one year left. During that, that year, an awful lot of historians, I think, throughout the country, were very, uh, very, very much interested in all of these old uh, New Dealers who were dying off. So much of what we did, the correspondence that we did, was that people would be sending him 
um, manuscripts asking, you know, I, I seem to remember several of them coming from um, Berkeley, excuse me, Stanford. Um, <clears throat> and it would be very hard for him to have to wade through all of this, but he had a real sense of history about it and that he wanted, you know, things to, things to be accurate. Uh, so my job was pretty much taking the dictation for him to answer after he had read the thing, and then I would uh, have to send the manuscripts back. Um, I had to deal with his uh, all the bill paying for uh, the servants, the whole house thing, the uh, all of the household stuff, and then anything else that had to be done. And he, he just couldn't, I mean, for instance, he would pay the phone bill three times and then say to me, take this home and fix it, um, which I would do. Um, <clears throat> it was in, in some ways, again, as, as the sort of kid from Saskatoon, it was my American education, but through Mrs. Biddle, also, because she had been very prominent in what was called, I think it was called the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, they were very big on civil rights. Um, uh, they, uh, I'm, I'm not able to remember all the names of the Harlem Renaissance people that she dealt with, but um, most of the poets and writers of that time were, she was friendly with them. She had grown up in, in New York in a very Henry Jamesian kind of uh, society. And she loved the idea that I, I had told her that if and when <laughs> I ever got past all these babies that I was going to try and write. And uh, she, was, uh, she was very encouraging. Um, I think that he had hated Groton, uh, loathed Groton, and he wrote a lot about his loneliness there. Uh, he wrote about the sort of forced religiosity of the place. It was very much based on Eaton or Harrow or you know the, the British schools. Uh, <clears throat> And then uh, the fact that his father died very young and left four boys, all of whom the mother had to somehow or other get them into Groton and Harvard and so on. There's a, uh, the, 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 books, uh, the first book is um, A Casual Past, and then the book about his being attorney general is called In Brief Authority. Um, that's one of the most beautiful passages in, in Shakespeare uh, that he put me on to. Uh, let me see if I can... It's in Measure for Measure. And um, I'm going to try this. Uh, it's one of Shakespeare's many, many uh, contemplations of man's evil and good and frailty and, and so on. And it goes, um, but man, a proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. Isn't that just, just amazing? So that was the, the second book, and, and these are available in, in Brief Authority. And I think that's, I think if you, there's anything else you want to know specifically about him, you'll have to ask me. Well, what made you decide to write a play about your experience working for him? Um, I guess uh, I was young enough at the time to be sort of naive enough to, to believe 
that someone with his privileged background, uh, even before Groton and Harvard and, and all of that, and the connections that he had, and he was a brilliant man. He had a mind like a steel trap. And it was being in this sort of small room with him, seeing the, the tragedy, really, of age, the diminishing of, of all of that, and the humiliation of that, uh, just, just had a tremendous effect on me. And uh, so I was, again, I was still inundated with babies, but um, I was able to write a one-act play that I think encapsulated what I really felt at the time, the immediacy of what I felt at the time. And then, uh, you know, as years went by and I had more time and, and I had more experience, I had written other things and I realized, you know, how, how to do two hours instead of one. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it was just that, uh, almost a little, little epiphany about old age. <laughs>